Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Did everyone enjoy their coffee break? Awesome. So I'm going to be speaking to you about delighting content editors with UX in Drupal 8. My name is Chandi Kosa. Um, here's what some of you may uh, imagine a content editor might be doing. They'll be sitting there at their typewriters, imagining these words to come up with, to put them in your Drupal site, perhaps. So, who am I? Um, I'm a freelance Drupal developer, consultant and trainer in London. Um, I'm a D8 core contributor and I do some stuff with Contrib as well. In London, I organise uh, the show and tell meetups and I also enjoy delivering Drupal training. Uh, and as some of you may have already seen me at lots of camps already, you may have realised I like tra travelling to different Drupal camps. So here's a cool image of an astronaut that was created by the Drupal Moldova Association that stayed with my slides ever since. Uh, it has some interesting information about something you'll find out. Uh, some of my clients include, uh, so I'm currently working at One Young World, which is a not-for-profit. I've also worked for some organizations you may have heard of, including uh, UNICEF, Health Foundation, Christian Aid, University of Westminster, University of Oxford. <coughs> Toyota and the Tate Art Gallery. So it's important to realize that inside Drupal we've got lots of different roles and there are times where we uh, might work in smaller teams we might need to do bits of work across the different spectrum. So I'm sure there's cases where some of us are back-end devs and we do some front-end or you know multiple different pieces in here but you'll see that the user experience area intersects with lots of others. So there are times where uh, it might be useful for you as a back-end dev uh, to think like your content editors or as a site builder. So what you get in Drupal 8 or Drupal 7 when you install it is you get the 7 theme. Hands up if you like keeping the 7 theme on your website. Cool. <coughs> Great. So this is a really good admin theme, but there are places where you want to customize this and you can have a sub theme of this. There are many different things you can do. Um, you have some other options for contract themes uh, for the admin theme in Drupal 8. So, but one of the issues is there are not too many options, which is one of the reasons most people tend to stick with using seven or one of a few other options. Um, most projects, need project specific customization. It can be a bit tricky doing this in your admin theme. Um, and by themselves, they don't always create the best user experience on their own. This is my favorite one. It's a uh, ad minimal theme. Um, and it's a admin theme for Drupal. Uh, if I ever see the Drupal 7 theme, I always try to replace it with this where I'm allowed to. There's also, in Drupal 8, an admin toolbar. So you wouldn't normally be able to hover on those items and see the children. Uh, admin toolbar allows you to do this. Uh, in this specific case, uh, there was a hiccup with the styling. You see these you know, list items. But you know, it can be fun. Uh, and it's important to separate your CSS and target one theme rather than the other. Um, a additional contract module to enhance the functionality of the admin toolbar is the adminimal admin toolbar, which uh, synchronizes those colors. So you'll notice the top line and the second line of the menu are now all consistent with the same coloring to match the adminimal admin theme. So you see it's gray here on the second line and black here. It's a very, very useful contract module. There's also uh, an option for the Google Material Admin theme. Um, and as some of you may have already come to notice from some of the talks we have during this camp, there is the Admin UI and JavaScript Modernization Initiative. So essentially this is about uh, enhancing what's already there in Drupal Core, so you don't actually have to go and grab other contract modules, but also allowing you, rather than just having a better admin interface, having additional JavaScript functionality 
uh, that can have more interactive experiences and makes that much easier for uh, content editors and everyone interacting with the back end of the group site. There's, uh, so there are some UX design processes and I'm going to give a quick history on some of these and then ways that they can feed in. So Brad Frost has something, a uh, creative concept called atomic design of atoms, molecules and organisms and templates and pages and it's important to understand these principles. I know many of you will already be familiar with this, but uh, considering it is always useful. And on his website, there's more information on atomic design. And you'll notice there's all these bubbles at the top. You can hover over those and they get colored in. I think that's really cool. Like this. I may have spent a few hours doing this, so, you know, this is the end of the presentation. No, no, not really. So, um, in the USA, there's a uh, local government initiative for Massachusetts. Uh, it's the state that Boston is in. So, mass.gov. This is what they've done. This is essentially the seven theme being uh, sub -themed. So, you'll notice that some things look quite different. So for instance, in your add content section, you have categorizations, and by clicking on different categories there, it will filter the results you see. So rather than having 30, 40, 50 content types and scrolling up and down, uh, it helps the content editors there. Also, you'll notice there are individual screenshots for each of these to show what the layout of that page looks like. In case you've got a brand new person on the team, they can see all of this information, and you can, to an extent, eliminate your user documentation. When they were going through their process, they were essentially um, going through the design process before putting this in Drupal, and this is what they had created during that process. And here's the implementation of that previous page inside of Drupal. Um, who has heard of the Tor module? Raise your hand. Okay. Who has used it on a client site? Aha. Well, here's an implementation. So you have the Tor module, and it gives you the ability to guide the user through certain steps. So, assuming someone might have just clicked on add content, you can give them the option of seeing this tour information or not. And in the URLs, you can actually specify if the tour module should be enabled or disabled, so you can take people directly to a node add page and either give them the tour module or not. As you'll notice, this has a few steps, and then you click next, and it takes you to the relevant part of the page and gives you inline information that can help you. So there are lots of small improvements uh, that can take you very little time but have a huge impact on a project. Um, and this all starts from way before even development even starts. So some of you may work in teams where you've got UX people and you've got really good discovery uh, processes, but there are also times where there are small organizations that don't have the luxury of all those different teams and processes. So listening to your users and asking them what terminology they would like would mean that perhaps developers would use the same language. So there'll be cases where maybe people have blog or news and they use different terms. It's useful to use the user-specific language consistently so your machine names stay the same and you, know, you don't have this extra documentation translating those terms. Um, also, this should be applied to the field labels and the names of content types but also description text on content types is really useful. And the same goes for help text. Also, um, if people don't need to see something, I've seen quite a few sites where I've worked on projects and as soon as I come in, the list at the top is huge and they've got every single admin option. Like you'll have a content editor working in an organization where all they do is create news articles 
and they could go in and like disable modules and put a site in maintenance mode and that's quite scary sometimes. <coughs> a, from, you know, when problems go wrong, it's harder to identify where they went wrong and who didn't, but also for other things like security and privacy, locking it all down with permissions. But also, by seeing too many options, people can get overwhelmed. So it's important to take care of the permissions and hiding menu items that you don't need. Two additional contract modules that help with this are field permissions, uh, which restrict permissions, and conditional fields, which based on actions higher up your node add or edit page, you can hide or show certain other fields lower down and only see what's relevant. <coughs> Here's an example of the field permissions page. You'll notice you've got the ability to specify certain permissions for individual uh, roles. And you can do this on your field edit page. Shortcut links. I'm also surprised how uh, rarely I see this used. But you've got your star icon there for shortcuts. And if you click on it, like has been done in this screenshot, you've got the ability to have quick links to common tasks. And if you want to go a step further, if you perhaps have five types of content editor on your site, and each of them need to do different things, it's useful to have shortcut sets for each of those and give them only the shortcuts that they need to do their particular job so they don't see what they don't need to see. And it speeds up their time. You've also got entity and term references. I'm sure many of you use these on projects all the time. There was a time where I was asked, what are those numbers in brackets? And, you know, some people get confused and it slows them down. So I think one thing we could perhaps try to do as a community is maybe get rid of that one here. I did try and play around with this once and realized, even though I successfully got rid of those numbers and it looks like it works, you press save and it doesn't save it. So, you know, that's, that's not how to fix the problem. Um, I'm sure there's smarter ways of doing it. I think there's a way of perhaps using uh, JavaScript to still have it there but hide it. Um, but this is feedback that I've been given from an ad agency client. And then with conditional fields, you'll notice here there's the uh, component type strip, but just below that you've got language. So in this, what I want to do is have a trigger for the language. So if it's English, so no additional fields, but if you choose uh, the other option, you will have uh, additional fields showing. So, let's see, will the magical GIF start working? Yes. So if you change it to native, you'll see those additional fields came up. And in this case, we've uh, done a multilingual hack for a client that doesn't have the budget to do multilingual straight away in their first phase. And you've got the ability to add override text in front. There's also autocomplete Gelux. So this enhances what you get in your UI for the autocomplete. Um, and here is some information from the project page. And over here you'll see the enhancement. So the top image shows you what you would normally see. So if you need to put multiple taxonomy terms into one field, you'd have to remember to comma separate them. Um, and once you've added them, it's tricky to perhaps move the second item into the fourth place or delete certain items. So Autocomplete Deluxe gives you the functionality at the bottom, and then you can just click on the red cross to delete it at any time, but you can also drag and drop the order of these items. I've also then added some help text at the bottom, uh, which includes a link to the full taxonomy term list. So, Autocomplete Deluxe. And in terms of help text, you've got the ability to add help text. Using that's really good. Um, and that's how I've added the link on the web here. Uh, 
Um, there's also in D8, there's a core module that some of you may not have noticed is there. It's inline form errors. So by enabling that, when you have a, a validation error, it can show you inline. And by clicking on the sections at the top in the messages area, it takes you down to the relevant bit. Um, you've also got the ability to create custom client sections for a project on that theme itself. So that's always generally done with sub themes. So you can do that with seven or with adminimal. In this particular case, I've sub themed the adminimal uh, theme and created that bit that says client custom section in the bottom right. So during this particular project, the, the client had said they um, didn't know which terms to add in because they didn't know which terms were available. So before creating the help text to open the full taxonomy term list in a new page, uh, a new window, I tried doing this with a client custom section and displaying the entire list as a view block, just really condensed. Um, but then they also thought that was overload. So I removed it. There's a contract module called Classy Paragraphs, which allows you to add classes to paragraphs, um, and then it's, it's all taken care of. And in the UI, over there, you've got blue in the background style, and you can just choose different options there, and then uh, you'll notice up there that you've got a blue section and a gray section, and you can control that from a content editor side, a flexible content. Does anyone have any questions so far? Cool. Okay. So that's the end of the presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Um, and I'll just show you some resources. Here is a list of resources on this website. And some more. And just before Q&A, there's a really cool event. If you've seen some people in orange t-shirts, they may be on the front row, perhaps. Uh, you have Matthew and Thomas. Um, they will be organizing an event uh, called Front End United. Front End United, yeah. Reunited. <laughs> so essentially, it's three days in May. Uh, the 16th is the day of workshops, 17th of 18th is the conference and this year it's going to be bigger and better than ever before and also alongside the main front end united conference there are multiple front end reunited events uh, across the world so make sure you come um, and now the q a Sounds like the same thing to me. Simpler and easier. Hmm. Maybe. Um, in general, the more work that you have, the more you can fiddle around with it, and the more you can get lost. So the trick is to have it structured in a certain way that it works. You said uh, you, you asked how to call the labels and these kinds of things. That helps a lot for the end user to understand. So adding more toolbars and more modules for uh, drop downs and so on might, it looks to me a little bit that it makes it more complex. Yeah, and I suppose I was just giving some quick wins, but also trying to highlight it's important to go through each of those stages and find the solution that works best for you by spending as much time with your users and user research and do what's best, but I suppose these are some of the examples I've seen. Um, and what would be great is to get a more enriched version of this. So um, I'm not sure if there are any more bits I can add at this point. Any other questions? Cool. <coughs>
Thank you very much.